Welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. I'm Chris Muntz, and this is episode 29, part one of Choral Music, a Human Art Form. This is going to be something new for me in the month of February. I am going to try what would, uh, I, for lack of a better term, be called a podcast mini series called Choral Music, the Human Art Form, and we are going to be focusing on issues surrounding representation in choral music of diverse populations, diversity as a larger topic, also diversity of programming, equity, education, really everything that it is that would kind of wrap itself into the theme of reaching all humans with the art form that we all love, choral music. And I'm choosing to do this in February because it's Black History Month, and I I want to explain a little bit about how I'm perceiving that so that everybody understands. Uh, You might have to adjust the color screen or color on your screen at whatever device you're using, but you you will if you get it set right, you'll notice that I am not black. Uh, So I don't think that I'm here trying to uh, contribute something in some profound way to Black History Month because that's not my job. My job, though, I feel, is to pay tribute to a really important part of American history by talking through where we've come from and where we are going. And one of the things that will run as a central theme throughout all the episodes that tie into this, and you'll know in your podcast feed uh, which episodes are kind of part of this series because they will all be called Episode 29, Part Something. And they will have that choral music a human art form title, and you'll be able to see regardless of who my guest is for that episode that that's the central idea. My perspective on this topic, bouncing off of other people, the guests that come on, uh, off of their perspective, and sometimes it might uh, agree and sometimes it might, might disagree, but my central idea surrounding the topic of representation, uh, equality, equity, justice, all the things that are a passion for many choral directors is nuanced in that I recognize that when I was coming into the choral profession 20 years ago, um, it was not necessarily a place where everyone could picture themselves being successful and being, uh, for lack of a better word, on the big stage. Okay, So I get that. At the same time, I'm also very proud of us as a profession that when I go to conventions, I don't see that anymore. Not to say the work is done, and that's part of the nuance, but I'm also wanting to weave into this thread some pride in my colleagues who are, in my opinion, pioneers and breaking ground on all of these things in ways that other educational fields even and other fields at large could learn a lot from. So we're going to acknowledge some things that have been struggles in the past. We're going to acknowledge our successes and be really excited about the progress we've made as a profession. And then we're going to also be talking, I'm sure, with many of the guests about what is work, what is the work left to be done? Where's the next step? And the way I see it, I, I'm such a growth mindset person that I don't see this as uh, the job will be done when we take the next step. I see it as what what step can we pass on to our kids and the next generation of choral directors. So that's a little bit of an intro into what this series is going to be. Again, not necessarily my con- contribution to Black History Month, but in the honor, in honor of and a tribute to uh, such an important part of our history and a, por- in a crucial por- part of our future. So we will uh, make this about way more than just black and white, because of course that doesn't cover the true diversity of the profession and of the art form across the globe definitely not in the U.S., uh, but that serves as a nice central point uh, for us in the U.S. anyway uh, to kind of wrap our minds around, I think, uh, the baggage that this topic has. So I will be approaching this in a way that uh, I believe is going to contribute to the conversation at the very least, because here's the the blunt uh, end of the sword, you might say. Uh, I'm just going to flat out say that a lot of us white conductors, in a lot of ways, are afraid to talk about this. We're afraid to talk about it for fear of saying the wrong thing. And so what I'm hoping is that you all, as you're listening, that you will listen and hear everyone out in the conversation, including me, because I will, as you know, always offer my opinion when I don't think that 
when I think there's a counterpoint that could be made. But I think that many of us are afraid to talk about it because we don't want to get canceled or whatever, and we want to be able to say uh, what we have to say and have it feel safe. And my, per my very strong belief is that if we are going to take the next step as a culture uh, towards unifying into some kind of truly choral culture that transcends race and gender and sexuality, which I got to believe we all want, like we've got to all want that at some point. Uh, in other words, do we want to say 200 years from now, do we really want to know, be gone, but know that everybody's still arguing about this stuff? Uh, I don't think we do want that. So my thought is, okay, so what? how do we take the next step? And my hint that I'm going to give here at the beginning is that I think in, if we are going to take those, nose, those next steps, we need all the people on board, including the white people, including a Trump supporter, including a Bernie supporter, including um, a college undergrad who's got no nothing in their educational wheelhouse other than the critical theory that they've been taught. We need that person to buy into a conversation with uh, somebody with a classical education who's got more of a, um, I guess you could say, Enlightenment era, era philosophy as their background or their education. And all these things cause a drastically different worldviews. And a different racial background causes a different worldview, a different cultural background, ethnic ethnic background, a different, different sexuality causes a different worldview. My point is that with we aren't going to get away from having different worldviews. What we have to learn how to do is look each other in the eye, person to person, and just talk to each other with the assumption, and you could go, I would encourage you to check back to episode nine when I talked about how if people, two people disagree, how should they argue about it? How should they discuss it? And look at each other with those different worldviews and see the person on the other side and assume that they want what's best for you until they give you a pretty solid concrete reason to believe that they don't want what's best for you. Now, <clears throat> I understand that not everybody has the same bar in that area. My bar is pretty high for that. Like I, 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 I'm not going to believe that you really want ill from me or for me unless you pretty much flat out say it or you start doing things that harm me, like maybe my reputation or you start harming my property or, or whatever. So my bar is pretty high and I, I get that m many people don't have the emotional patience for that, but that's kind of where I'm coming from is I want to open these dialogues up and, and my hope is that, uh, that people get a chance to voice um, their ideas about this topic, but at the very least, even if you don't get a chance to voice it on the podcast, you're getting a chance to hear different perspectives and also hear it in a constructive environment where you can feel safe, hopefully then taking into your community and your colleagues, a conversation that can really broaden the tent. And that's the goal is to broaden the tent of these conversations. And I'm going to start out by telling you a little story that helped to inspire this series. But before we get to this hilarious story that happened on Facebook last Saturday, uh, I'm going to shout out some sponsors for this episode real quick, and I really encourage you to go check out some websites of some awesome professionals who really know what they're doing and are really good people. These are all mom-and-pop companies, just like my little one-year-old podcast is. Uh, so I would encourage you to check out their products and, of course, use the promo code Coralosophy at checkout. You get 10% off at all of these places. First... Voce Vista Video is blowing my mind every single time I use it. I'm still about a, a two years or so in, in the classroom of using this product. It's a, something I use about monthly, uh, sometimes not even every month, but uh, every bi-monthly, but I use it pretty regularly in my voice studio, and I'll throw it up on the screen in uh, choir rehearsals, and it allows us as a choir to see the entire overtone spectrum that we are creating when we sing. It shows even if the vowel is not the right shape, the not, not the right resonance, the overtones change and the kids can see it. So they can see immediately that they're not singing a pure O anymore. They can see that they're not singing a pure E. Or if the basses are singing a pitch and the tenors join an octave above, they can see immediately that it was skewed up above the pitch or below the pitch. They can see exactly where it is. And for our visual learners and our differentiated learning, that's huge. So check that out. Go to vocevista.com backslash Coralosophy. And then you can try it for free for 30 days. And then once the trial's up, you can put in the code and, and purchase that and get the discount. Also, we have sightreadingfactory.com, where if you are not on that yet this school year, first of all, you're way behind 
I'm not trying to shame you, but get on there. SightreadingFactory.com is $35 a year for your membership. And then just for a couple bucks a kid, you can add a student membership for each kid. And it's hugely beneficial. Uh, you can get the, the full package, everything that you get if you use your Coralosophy discount code. Uh, that'll work there as well. But it's not too late. That's the thing. You can start this stuff with literacy skills with your kids. And you don't need to go buy a How to Teach Literacy textbook. You really don't. You have everything that you need right there. Go listen to episode 18 on this show where I kind of outline the process. And if you have questions, shoot me an email, but it is not too late. You can start in January. You can start in February. So head to sightreadingfactory.com and grab yourself a membership. So here's the story. I was about a week ago at the Missouri Music Educators Convention, and I had the pleasure of sitting in the audience and watching Jason Max Ferdinand conduct the Missouri All-State Choir. And partly because of who Jason is as an artist and as a musician, and watching him rehearse the kids and having this magnetism that he, he carries in a rehearsal mixed together with still the euphoria from his uh, Aeolian's performance at ACDA National Convention and being so excited to hear him in a, in a Meet the Allstate Conductor session the day before where he pretty much talked about all the stuff that he and I talked about in episode 11 of this podcast back in the summer. So I was just super excited. All this stuff was swirling around in my head as I watched this. And, and when the kids sang and opened the concert with America the Beautiful, which I found fascinating, by the way, um, and they sang it so beautifully, the audience gave like a half-standing ovation after the first piece. Um, uh, many of the folks weren't ready to stand up yet, but then several people, just hundreds, just jumped up. Um, and so he had, you know, he and the choir had me on that day, just on cloud nine of choral music is a human art form, one human family, euphoria, right? I'm feeling all the feels. I'm uh, choir nerd heaven going on. And importantly, because it's one of my passions, I'm sitting here recognizing this, this thematic thread through his program with the Allstate Choir about the unifying power of music. And so I'm feeling that vibe, right? As I get up to go out and drive home to Kansas City. Um, a few minutes after the concert's over, I see a post. Keep in mind, I'm still juiced up with the One Human Family vibe from the concert, and I see a post on a, on a Facebook page called Pretentious Classical Music Elitists, which is a, when I joined the group, my understanding was a, a, um, <laughs> an ironic title, uh, meaning it was supposed to be making fun of, like we're making fun of ourselves for being really into classical music, and that's why you join, and then you can post memes about how, you know, dumb Bach is or how overrated Mozart is and everyone can yell at you and say, oh no, you know, he's amazing and he's the greatest musician of all time, blah, blah, blah. And people just, it was all in good fun and I could see it as pretty harmless. But then about three or four months ago, I started noticing that there must be a new moderator in this group that is continuously changing the topic from what musicians people like to uh, topics around um, representation of non-white people in classical music. And that was, that was like a pretty regular posting going on in that group. And it was causing some pretty big arguments, of course, as you can imagine. This is a topic that never really goes well. And I started noticing that that was odd because that, that's not really what the group was. Like there, if you want to do some decolonizing the music room stuff, you've got there are groups for that for sure. Uh, but this wasn't one of those groups until relatively recently. And so I'm giving you some background now. So I come out of the Allstate again. I, I see this post and the post was, why does representation in choral music matter? Okay, so and it was a nice, big, colorful post, and as if you know, wel welcoming you in with um, roses and scented oils to you know walk in and make your comment, and, and as if it was going to be a very non-hostile environment, right? It was even pink. It was pink, and and I fell for it, right? And I I answered. Here was my answer uh, again. The question. Why does representation in classical music matter? My answer, it was, it matters because music is for all, from all to all. It can and should transcend innate characteristics. And of course, innate meaning you're born with it. So the music can and should transcend. I did not say that it has transcended, and that we are done getting better at all the things related to representation. I, but my ideal is that it can 
and it should, and that's what I posted. And pretty quickly, my post got a lot of reaction, and it was positive, lots of likes and loves and all that stuff, because I thought that was a pretty, um, I thought that was a pretty non-controversial take, uh, meaning that don't we all want, isn't that what we all want? Don't we want our art form? And I'm gonna, I'm including choral music in, under the umbrella of classical music simply because it's one of those academically learned art music genres, right? Which starts all the way back in Europe, of course, as we'll discuss here in a minute, but has since spread the globe and is now something that people of every shade and every gender and every sexuality participate in, find joy in, and find expression in. So choral music to me is one of the little the family tree under this bigger, broader classical music. Now I recognize that classical music also has a more narrow definition, which I do acknowledge in this Facebook post I'm about to tell you about, uh, that, that maybe she meant that the specific 1750 in Europe, you know, that music, uh, in which case I would still have made an argument that that can transcend too, because anyone can perform Mozart and derive joy from it. And if that's not the point of art, I'm out, y'all. Like, I don't understand what other goal you would need from art making other than to give joy to the performer and to the audience. That that it, we, That is who we are trying to be. Now, joy could come in the form of all kinds of things. So for those of you who say, oh, 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 no, there's other goals. We could be informing, we could be teaching. To me, those are all just, those are forms of joy. It, we, we feel joy when we have learned something, when we've had a deeper connection, when we've had a deeper experience. All those things are part of it. So feel free to add your own, your own words to that. I don't disagree. Um, so my response, it, it matters because music is for all, from all to all. It can and should transcend char innate characteristics. So like I said, got a bunch of likes and loves and people saying I agree uh, and, and all of this. Then the moderator jumps in and says, first response from her, how does something specifically European transcend European characteristics? Um, which is, was an interesting twist of the words. Now, it was an interesting twist because I didn't say uh, European characteristics. It doesn't, I didn't say transcend European characteristics. I said transcend, transcend innate characteristics. So, meaning no matter what your DNA says, I don't see a connection between DNA and music making. I, ju I just don't. Um, you could argue that it has some cultural um, connections, of course, uh, but ultimately humans are individuals first and members of cultures second. Um, they So if a person from a culture chooses because they love Mozart to become a Mozart scholar, but that culture that that person comes from is not Austrian, for example, I don't see a problem with that. I think anyone who loves Mozart should study Mozart. And that, of course, copy-paste to any other form of music or form of art that you, you could fill in the blank. So I thought that was an odd response to my post. Um, and I think she, at this point, I'm still thinking she's just trying to get a dialogue going, right? I'm, I'm not sensing any sharks in the water yet. Uh, and so my response was, similar to what I just told you, I don't accept the premise that it is specifically European. So she said, how does something specifically European transcend European characteristics? And she said, why? Why does it not, why do you not accept that premise? And my response was this, number one, the place of origin for a thing does not define that thing for all time. This is called the genetic fallacy in logic. Um, I've discussed the genetic fallacy on this show before. Human history is filled with inventions from one place spreading to another. Um, things that start in a place don't necessarily always start stay there. And one of the arguments that she and I had gotten into on a previous post, uh, which ended better, by the way, ended well not with me not getting kicked out, was that her position is that classical music only spread the globe because of the violence of colonialism. So uh, I, of course, responded to her that I'm fairly confident that the ships that came over bringing guns to colonize did not also bring theorbos and sackbutts and organs. The music would have followed, of course, as the culture started to change, but the, 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 to, to lay the spread of classical music solely at the feet of colonialism, to me, is a very, very 
non-nuanced and very ill-informed reading of history. Can colonialism be attributed to some of that spread? Absolutely. To all of it, I, I can't imagine with a straight, straight face arguing that the only reason that a good idea, like classical music, like art music, which is a good idea, it, it, was, a, it was invented in a place, but spread mostly, I would argue, because it was a good idea. People enjoyed it. They thought it was pretty. They liked the counterpoint. They liked the, the, style, the, new, the new instruments that were being invented for it. And that was also part of why it spread. Spread. I am not going to argue at all that colonialism did not play a role. Not saying that at all. But we got. I think we've got to get away from these univariable, just one variable explanations for super, super complicated things. We're setting ourselves up to just get so easily destroyed in a, in a debate, especially in an academic setting. Because you ask someone to prove that. Uh, yeah, good luck. You can't prove something that has one variable. So that was my that was that's the explanation I'm diving into now of my first response. So because the place of origin doesn't define that. And here's an easy example: blue jeans were invented in the U.S. People wear them everywhere. They spread because they're a good idea, not because someone made someone over in China wear blue jeans. That they they spread because they're they're durable and you can wash them a whole bunch of times and they still work. And it was a relatively innovative creation. And they spread. Classical music is no different. It was an invention, innovation that now benefits the lives of everyone who is not white, who participates in it. To me, that's the ultimate social justice. Something created by one group can be shared by all, and that's beautiful. My second reason for thinking that I don't uh, accept the premise that classical music is purely a European thing is many non-Europeans perform and compose it. Uh, now, now they do. Uh, and so to me, you could say that at one point in history, it was uh, specifically European and, and primarily, if not exclusively European, but it isn't now. And so I think that matters. I think that the change over time matters. The third reason is that my students and my audience members of all races and ethnicities deserve to experience great art that they can access and that they want to access. And as I said earlier in the episode, most humans of all races, genders, and sexualities don't give a flying fig about classical music at all anyway, so I don't really know why we're arguing so much in our profession. I see it in posts and on blogs all the time about who is accessing classical music and, and who uh, as, as the primary focus, because what if the primary focus was growing the whole pie? The whole pie, if that was our primary focus. Now again, don't read into this. He did not just say, this mean podcast host did not just say, why are we focused on caring who accesses it because it doesn't matter who accesses it. That's not what I'm saying. Because we want diversity and access, and we want, I want, diversity and representation in all these areas. But I believe the best way to get there is if our focus is on growing the whole pie inside of the pie, and these are people who care about this kind of music, is going to be more and more different types of people from different types of backgrounds as we create a family of people from all walks of life who love this kind of music. So that's my motivation. So that's what I thought I was trying to communicate. Uh, we all have students and uh, of all types of stripes that love this music and benefit from it. So I, and I also did throw at this point into the thread, I threw in my recognition that we might be using two different definitions of classical. So I threw that out there just as a bone, just to make sure that we weren't crossing our wires. And she said, no one is asking you to advocate diversity to me, LMAO. Advocating for diversity and saying Western art music is not a product of Western culture are two different things. Don't mix two different arguments together to make it seem like they are both correct. There is a specific reason Western art music has spread so wide across the globe and I'll give you a hint, colonialism. The specific reason. Just discussed that a second ago. I don't buy that. I think that's one of many. Okay, so of course, she and I had gone down this road before. Um, and so then she says, um, it's okay to say something is European without saying it has to be confined to Europeans. I don't know if it is. I don't know if that is okay linguistically to say something is specifically European, which she said earlier. My response was it isn't specifically European because not only Europeans do it. I don't know that you can have it both ways. 
it is either specifically European or it isn't. If it were specifically European, then it would have, we would be ex talking about who we exclude, not, not who we include. And I'm not interested in talking about who we exclude. I, I am so over it. And I'm so tired of breaking people into groups. It's just, it's so annoying. I, I want to be a person and I want you to be a person and we will interact with each other as people. That's my vibe. Then, finally then after that post, she decided to throw actual race into it. And she said, why are white people so afraid to say something as a part of white culture? Well, I didn't even answer that because I'm already on record on this show saying that I don't believe white culture exists. I don't think that's a thing. You could make an argument that even in the U.S., in the United States, there are probably 10 to 12 different white cultures uh, that are distinct, like that any sociologist would say these behaviors are a culture, and these behaviors are a culture. If you're white in Manhattan, you are not the same culture as white in Georgia. I'm sorry, you're not. If you are white in 1600 Italy, and you are white in 1600 Sweden, you've never been into each other's country, most likely, and you are not the same culture. You speak a different language, you have different customs, different religious backgrounds. All of the things that sociologists define as a culture, there are, so there are white cultures, plural, but there are not white culture. I'm tired of that. It does not exist. In the same way that saying somebody from Panama is Mexican is offensive for obvious reasons. It's not, it's, they are different cultures. Okay. So let's, that, that's where I didn't even, I didn't go there on the post because I didn't feel like that would be smart. Uh, so I just kind of laughed that off and kept going. And so at that point, then I kind of encouraged her to maybe specify when she's talking about this kind of stuff in the future, just say maybe European classical music would have been a better post for her to make. Would European classical music, because then you kind of eliminate all the other stuff, the confusion I had earlier. And then it kind of got a little bit, uh, a little bit uglier, uh, because she said even if art music is composed in, say, Latin America, it still has Eurocentric roots because Europe colonized Latin America and forced classical music upon the natives violently. Forced the classical music on the natives violently. I'd love to see some citations of that. I don't know that the music was the what was being forced. And even if you could make an argument for that, I don't know that in the everyday lives of the average people back then that that was the primary concern. Um, they're not, they're, they weren't waking up every day with the fear of what music they might hear. They were, making, they were waking up with the fear of how much of their crop this new colonizer was going to steal in taxes or whatever. That was what their concern was. But again, I'm not going to go open all that can of worms, but this is uh, this is the min the mindset that is going on right now, and I'm a little bit nervous about it um, because it's again it's one variable. I can point to this as the cause, and I think these are things that people are being taught in college now. That's my suspicion, and I've read a lot about that and heard a lot about it, and it really worries me. It's so easy to find a villain in co colonialism. It was brutal, but then to say that everything that came after that and could be tied to that in some way is also bad. It's, it's just too simple. That's more, more complicated than that. So then she makes the, comp, the statement, and I find this to be, this is where we really parted ways, is that the idea that all music is universal in the sense that everyone can understand the meaning behind a certain work of music is false. She said flat out, music is not, the idea that music is universal is false because it all, everyone has, at one point or another, many cultures have had their music violently stolen from them, which, again, that's not the point that I'm trying to argue. There, that probably could, you could make an argument that that happened, but that doesn't mean that the humans alive today can't make some type of human connection based on music they enjoy. Again, so few humans of any race enjoy classical music, Let's take the win where we can get it. That's my perspective. If we've got uh, somebody for, who grew up in an indigenous culture in Mexico um, and had never heard Mozart before, ever in their whole life, and by some whim of luck, uh, is find this themselves in an audience at a, at a really excellent performance of Mozart and is just overcome, has that person just been colonized? Or does that person have an artistic experience? 
that that maybe change their life. Maybe that becomes a new uh, source of joy for them. That to me, I see no downsides. I don't see any downside in that at all. Does that mean that person should forget about their indigenous music? You know what? Honestly, I don't care. I don't care if that person forgets about their indigenous music. I don't know my indigenous music. I don't know any German art songs except for the one, the two or three that I learned in college, and I'm mostly German. Right. So it, that to me, it's you, music is about following you what ticks your box. Right. And if that person sits in an audience and hears Mozart for the first time and they're just over overwhelmed, then you let that person be overwhelmed and go become a Mozart nerd. You know, it's it's OK. And this happens in my classroom all the time too. kids from all kinds of backgrounds come across some music that is not, quote, theirs. And they love it. And I'm just going to encourage that love. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to continue to expose my students to as many art forms as I possibly can, more genres of music and places in the world that, that, that it can come from. But honestly, I'm not going to be able to expose, it to expose them to all of it. There's not enough time in the day. There's not enough time in my lifetime to become an expert enough in all of those areas of music to even teach it competently. And I'm not going to feel guilty about that. I'm just not. I'm not going to sit up late at night about it wishing that I had learned more styles of music. I'm, I work my butt off to learn as much about music from as many places in the world as possible so I can expose my students to it. And I'm going to be sleep happy at night knowing that what I did was not to expose them to everything that exists, but to expose them to just enough that they have curiosity forever about the types of music that exist in the world. And when I say that music is universal, that's what I mean. I mean that you don't have to expose yourself to everything to understand that there is this world out there that you can search. Okay, I'm going to jump into the story and interrupt myself for just a couple minutes and talk to you about a couple more sponsors that are so awesome to have as part of this show and on board. And, and they, I've grouped them together in this little segment because if you have sheet music needs as second semester fires back up and as you're approaching your contest season, or even if you're just planning ahead for next year or for an end of the year concert, I've got two awesome friends on board with the show that you can go to and search online and have the music ready to print from your printer within seconds and not have to wait for shipping and not have to wait for a vendor to reply. You can just go right to ryanmain.com and check out some of his independently published music, which is becoming more and more popular. I'm seeing it being performed all over the country and his stuff is so great and you should check it out. And he does something really cool with his purchases too, where once you buy that PDF, you own it and forever, and you can make as many copies as you want forever. He doesn't make you count the copies, which is really cool. So you get that, you save the PDF, you don't have to store anything in your music library, you just store it on your computer, and then three years from now, when you want to do it again, you just print more, because you own that copy license. <clears throat> so that's a really cool thing. Plus, you can enter Coralosophy at checkout, get 10% off. Then you can head over to graphitepublishing.com, and you can scroll through a whole bunch of composers over there, many that you know. So Eric Barnum, Tim Takash, Jocelyn Hagen, Joshua Shank, all kinds of stuff by many, many great composers are on there. And what I love about Graphite is their search engine to sort all their different music. So if you're looking for choirs of multiple levels, of multiple voicings, you can enter all those categories into their search engine and it will churn out everything that's on their site that meets that criteria. So strongly encourage you to use those two sources, uh, ryanmain.com, graphitepublishing.com, support those awesome mom and pop businesses and send them your, your attention. And then when you check out, you enter Coralosophy at checkout, you get a discount and then they know that you're listening to this show. It helps a lot. So head over there and check out those sites. Okay, back to the story now. So I responded to this, I thought, pretty bold statement that universal music existing is false. And I said, classical music, yes, did originate in Europe. I have no argument there. Uh, but it also, we could also been, have been referencing, as I said, this whole time, a broader definition now of what classical music is. And in my mind, that's what is productive, is to address the, the broader spectrum, or else why are we even having this conversation about diversity in choral music, for example? Why are we even having the, que the, the question and having a discussion about it if we think that certain types of choral music is white music? If Mozart is, like, just, just my example for the episode, if Mozart is white people's music, why do we care 
how many people that aren't white are performing it. To me, that's another you can't have it both ways kind of a thing. It either, it, it either started as white people music because it was written by a white person and then became not that, which is that's how I, I would prefer that we looked at it. it started there fine, but we, it's been possessed. It's been repossessed. It's been shared so many times at this point that Mozart is a meme. Memes aren't, that's the whole point of a meme is it originates somewhere and then who knows where and, and it just spreads to everywhere. I, and so if classical music, thinking of it as a meme in the broader definition. So what I don't accept, this is when I was writing to the moderator, so I write to the moderator that what I don't accept is that there is, as a, there is as a result, now and forever, classical music is a European thing. I cannot accept that as a definition. It doesn't make sense. It's not defensible. Um, and it doesn't put us further towards the goal of one human family. And anything that doesn't, to me, I will not accept as, as an acceptable thing because I, that's, to me, that's just as bad as how as some other really racist things that I've heard from I won't go super political in this episode but from people who say racist things to me that's just as racist that that is like no we need to talk about unifying we need to talk about how any people who choose an art form are all welcome and don't care where you came from what your background is if you like this do it you should pursue it it's you can do it Yes, maybe not very many people that look like you do this, but you're you and and you like it. And that's how I talk to my students if they voice this types of concerns. I don't see very many people like me that do, but you like it. You be you. You do you. And if you enjoy this music, pursue it because it's got something for you in it. You can find something for you in it. And so so I will I will say uh, that... What that I don't accept that that it's just now and forever a European thing. I'm not going to rehash the colonialism argument with this moderator, but I will say that what to whatever extent colonialism played in spreading ideas, it does not hold logically that all of those ideas were necessarily bad. It just again a single variable definition for things just does not work. Colonialism was bad. We can say that. We can say that the act of showing up on somebody's shore in a boat full of guns to slaughter and kill and take their stuff is bad. We can absolutely say that. But to say then that everything that in some way was adjacent to that event afterwards was also bad is a leap of logic that is, you, you just, it doesn't work that way in logic. Too many things are intertwined. Uh, clouds have silver linings. Sometimes really bad things happen and something good happens from it. And if, even in her argument that the only reason classical music spread across the globe was colonialism, then I would say, okay, we found a silver lining. Now, that seems, we're not used to that kind of blunt language anymore. But there, a bad thing could, let's say a bad thing happened. And if something good happened from that, let's take the win. The, some some silver linings do occur from from thing now, but even then, I don't think that's a fair fair description. I think lots of things that could be construed later as having been good could have occurred after the fact of colonialism, and and maybe you could say go back in time and undo colonialism, and certain things wouldn't have happened. But what kind of mental gymnastics are we doing at that point? We can't go back and undo that stuff. So to me. What is the productive thing as we look at each other again, right now, as humans, how can we make a better world? So attempting to denigrate anything that is colonial adjacent seems entirely unhelpful where, anywhere outside of a college critical theory course. That, that's the only time when you'd ever talk about this in that way and have it make sense, but in the real world, it doesn't. Instead, we could operate now, today, and in the future towards a better world. I believe that art music can help us do that because I believe it's powerful for everybody. If you don't believe that, that's okay. That's that was the last kind of post that I made to her. To her, um, then she went back and and said that it actually is possible to decolonize. So it's not unproductive to decolonize the uh, things. There are tons of grassroots grass, grassroots movements, um, and she said that I'm that I made a statement that decolonization doesn't exist, which is really um, 
naive, she said. And I, of course, I never said de decolonization doesn't exist. <clears throat> I said it's not always productive and it's not always blaming the right problem. So that, that I said, uh, and I stand by that. And she said that my response, of course, is very sheltered from the realities of the people on the ground. Uh, at first, I wondered how many students of color she taught in her life, because my answer, my guess would be very few. Um, and then went ahead to, ta uh, to tag a bunch of uh, social justice related kind of uh, Facebook groups and some of which I had heard of. And my response was that I think all of those social justice projects that she tagged me in um, were very are, are very important work. In fact, here's, I'm just going to read directly from what I posted. I think all of that is important work. You may think that I don't mean that after the conversation we just had, but I do. I do mean that. I agree that any musical expressions that have been silenced or suppressed should be studied and performed and shared. That being said, that's not my work. That's not my framework through which I approach my work. One beautiful thing about 2020, the year we live in, is that people can specialize in fields more than ever and ever before. My expertise is for choirs. That is my job and my chosen field. That's not going to change. I will use my expertise to reach as many lives as I can and help students discover as much music from as many cultures and heritage as I can in the minutes I have them and in my diverse classrooms. The real world is finite, and we can't all study all music or become even qualified to teach it. I don't feel guilty about that at all. My job is to send my kids out into the world with a curiosity for music that would open their ears to what a diverse world offers. Thanks for the links. I was familiar with most already. In fact, I have been planning to have someone from Decolonizing the Music Room on the Choralosophy podcast, which I told her to discuss all of this. And I do. I've been planning that for a while. I disagree with many of the approaches, but I agree with the goal. I think it's an important conversation. Let me say that part again. I disagree with some of the approaches that the decolonization of the music classroom movement has, but I agree with the goal, which is getting more kids from more backgrounds involved in the music classroom. We agree on that goal. I thought that that statement was a branch of peace. I was trying to offer uh, a little olive branch there at the end of this debate. Then she said that it's not really my place to disagree because I am a colonization benefactor. You can, you can decolonize your choir and classroom from problematic language and acts just by being aware as possible of what is problematic. And at that point, I immediately, the, the question's popping into my head that I didn't type, but like who gets to decide what's problematic? Um, not every person of, of color that you might have in your classroom might agree on what pr is problematic. I know this is true because I've spoken to so many people of so many different skin colors about these topics. They don't all agree with each other. Not all white people agree with each other on this topic either. So who gets to decide? Again, my, that's why my policy is I'm going to look at you and you're going to look at me and we're going to have a conversation. And so my response then uh, was to just point out uh, that I'm afraid this is some more genetic fallacy. And I'll kind of get towards the end of the episode, we'll define that for you one more time. Genetic fallacy is the logical fallacy that happens so much that it needs a name that people will make the argument that because of the identity of the person saying the thing, you can derive some kind of idea about its validity. Which, of course, just thinking about it for a few seconds, critically, you can realize right away that that's not true. So if someone who is well known, for example, to be a horrible failure in the field of mathematics <clears throat> tells you that 2 plus 2 is 4, you shouldn't, because of their past and who they are, assume they're probably wrong. You should just do the math and see if they're right. Uh, so if someone says something, you don't get to just say, because you're a this, you shouldn't, that's probably not valid. That's called the genetic fallacy. Um, I've, I've discussed this on the show before, and, and I know this is one of those examples that's such a meme that people make fun of it, but it, I haven't come up with a better one. It's the, the Hitler is a painter example. It's, it's kind of a cliche, but I think it, t it paints the genetic fallacy really well, which is that Hitler is a bad guy. Uh, he is bad because he believed in the superiority of his race and used that as a justification to slaughter millions of people. And like colonizers, 
show up on people's shores, metaphorically with boats, metaphorically, and kill them and take their stuff. <clears throat> it makes him a bad guy, okay? But he also liked to paint. And if you're looking at one of his paintings and you like it, you think it's a good painting because something in the painting you see catches your eye and it gives you joy in some way. Have you just validated Hitler as a person or did you validate the painting? On the flip side of that, if you think the painting sucks, does the painting suck because Hitler's a bad guy? Or does the painting suck because his use of shading and color relationships to each other and, uh, and angles is not very realistic? In other words, is the painting suck because of something that can be found in the painting itself or in the identity of the painter? If your argument is that the identity of the painter somehow shows up on the painting itself, then you might just not know enough about painting to know that you can actually see things in the art itself that is independent from the identity, the genetics, say, of the artist. So that's the genetic fallacy. And I pointed out that, that uh, I'm afraid that that's what we're discussing in this Facebook discussion, where because something started somewhere doesn't mean you can get validity or invalidity from it, just knowing where it comes from. You've got to look at the art itself. Um, and I said, with respect, I will also not be told where my place is. She said it was not my place to disagree. And I said that that, that it kind of attempt to intimidate me into keeping my opinion to myself isn't going to work on me. She uh, Admittedly, she hasn't met me. Um, that's not going to work on me. It's not going to change what I express, and it's not going to change what I won't express. I will engage anyone with ideas. If you've got an idea that engages my idea, I will engage it. Obviously, if you've listened to any am amount of episodes of this podcast, you know that's true. I will engage the ideas, and I'm happy if you disagree with me. I am happy to... to talk to you about it, okay? And we will talk to each other as people. But if I'm not happy to have, and this is what I typed, I'm not happy to have the ideas shut down. And if, if the disagreement causes the ideas to be shut down, then I think we're done here in this conversation. Okay, so this is where the story gets funny. She then says, who intimidated you, LMAO? To which I replied, no one. At that point, Within seconds, I was blocked from the page. Um, I asked my wife, quickly texted her. She was at home from the convention this year. She was sick. I said, hey, go on this page, because she was a member, and screenshot stuff. Screenshot the whole conversation, because the, this this is becoming so silly that I just need to talk about this. This is, needs to be something that gets aired out. Let's talk, have the conversation about this. And so the screenshots became very valuable. And as soon as I was blocked, she, Beth was sending me more screenshots of what happened after I was blocked. She waited till I was blocked, at which point she posted, OMFG, white fragility is saying I'm attempting to intimidate when I'm just effing, I'll keep this clean, but she used the whole word, when I'm just effing having a discussion. Waste of effing time. Goodbye, enjoy your fragility elsewhere, and know that you're a shitty teacher if this is your attitude. I feel sorry for your non-white students. Okay. And so she, what ended up happening was once she realized um, that the possibility that I might talk about this on my podcast arise, arose, both Beth and I got Facebook messages, private Facebook messages, threatening us that if we discussed this, anything that happened on this private Facebook group, that we would be sued. And of course, I'm not worried about that. Um, this is, it's when you post something on Facebook, by the way, you don't own it anymore. Uh, Facebook does. So just FYI for everybody's out there. Uh, but, uh, she did, uh, I did say that I will not use her name and I'm not, cause I'm not interested in dragging this person. I'm not interested in doxing her. I brought this to the attention of my audience because the ideas in, in this discussion are important because there are two competing schools of thought on these topics. There is the critical theory way of looking at things, which is to find the villain and then f try to figure out how many what things you can tie to what that villain did. And how, how does the spider web of that villainy affect everything that is that it touches? Um, and that's being taught. That is something that is being taught in schools. Um, it was not being taught that way when I was in school, so I learned it in a different way. 
I learned more in the uh, what would now be called classical education style or not to assume that there was a problem that you can then tie to something and, as a blame, but to, to try to find logic and reason and evidence to whether or not there is a problem and whether or not there is a connection. Find the variables, you know, that type of thing. Uh, the scientific method, basically. So these enlightenment ideas, that's, that's the, that was the foundation of my education as a kid and as a college student. So we're living in, in these kind of two different worlds, and the conversation between those two worlds is not going well. Uh, we're not seeming to be able to negotiate those two different ways of looking at issues. Um, and so I'm a little bit frustrated that the conversations tend to end that way, where somebody gets blocked, and it's usually um, the person who uh, doesn't buy into that orthodoxy, that, it, that colonization is bad, which we agreed on, but then you also have to agree that coloniza colonization is bad and is still bad and is still something that is affecting the classroom and is still something that's affecting this and this and it's touching all these things, which that might be true in some cases, but it's just not that simple to, to paint things with a broad, a broad brush. So on this show, my plan is to uh, uh, approach these issues with people who know lots of stuff about them and, and many cases who live these things uh, and have a nuanced conversation about what, not only what can we do about it, but where have we come what, what types of progress have we made in this area that we can celebrate so that we can take that celebration as a springboard to take the next step towards uh, finding true equity, true equality, um, true understanding of each other as humans. So I found that to be a very fascinating and interesting uh, experience to have gone through right after seeing the Allstate Choir and how, uh, how unified and how they sang classical music and gospel and they sang spirituals and they sang Latin motets and they sang uh, all these different things and everybody from every background and Jason and, and everybody together just we were we were all in it and it didn't matter the skin color of the singer it didn't matter the skin color of the conductor it didn't matter the skin color of the audience members we were just there in the moment and I believe that is the promise and the prophecy of choral music and I hope you agree uh, I don't necessarily need you to agree on all of the points that I made, uh, but I do hope we agree on that that is the goal. And if Because if we can agree that that's the goal, then a lot of the disagreements we might have on how to analyze the situation will be okay. Will be okay. As long as we all, uh, we all agree to assume about the other person that their goals are the same. We do both have good goals. Let's start there and then work out to the to the problems and if we can do that i think we're going to have a great future as a profession thank you so much for sticking with me all the way through that uh that ended up being a little bit of a longer story than i thought it was going to be but i'm really passionate about this and i really believe in the prophecy and the future of choral music and i believe that we are going to be okay and i'm encouraged by a lot of the conversations that are happening on this show. And if you're enjoying the conversations, again, not necessarily because you agree with everything, but if you appreciate the conversation in good faith, then there are lots of things you can do to help support the mission of this show. Uh, a couple things that are really easy, like, subscribe, rate, any kind of app that you use or website that you use to listen to podcasts. There's usually some way uh, to give some feedback to the show. Those things are more than just to make me feel better. Uh, those things actually help the, the show become visible on that app. So if you go into the Apple iTunes app, for example, and give it a five-star rating, if you really like it, the more of those five-star ratings that it gets, then the, the farther up it goes on the search results uh, for podcasts. And this show actually, shockingly and amazingly, has gotten all the way up to number 23 in all of performing arts podcasts in the U.S. at certain points this year. Uh, and the way we do that is by getting that traffic on the Apple app, for example. So that was an iTunes ranking that was really exciting. And if you're, if you're rating it, it's also very nice for you just to type out a little blurb of a review. Uh, again, these things make the show more visible. Other ways to help make it more visible... Uh, send it out on your social media. So share the link to a, an episode. That's very helpful. And then there's, of course, ways that you can uh, kick back to the show through the Patreon, which we're having a lot of fun growing that Patreon page. It's patreon.com backslash Coralosophy. And you can, for as little as $3 a month or the cost of a coffee, 
get on there and, and hear an extra episode every month. There's a, a short episode that's for patrons only. It gives a lot of behind the scenes updates on the show. Um, I'm also revealing future guests on the show to the patron mem Patreon members. So that's a way you can support, but also get a little bit of extra content. Anytime I create extra documents for the shows as well, that's where they go and have access there for subscribers. Then finally, last but not least, just spread the word. Tell your friends uh, that we're having a great time having this converse, having these conversations, and you wouldn't still be listening uh, if you didn't appreciate it. I think so. Do me that favor and help me spread the word. Uh, this year, so far, after one almost one exact year of the podcast, uh, it's really doing well in terms of total numbers. Uh, but in order for the show to become financially stable and sustainable for uh, the foreseeable future, which is is really a goal, I would like for this to be my side job for the rest of my career. This is the type of thing I could probably do even after I retire from teaching. This would be a really fun resource to continue to provide. But the way we do that is by spreading the word and making sure that the, the total numbers and downloads can keep uh, climbing up so that we can do this. So this can be a thing that we build together as a community. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time. Don't forget the upcoming episodes in February are going to be part of this series, this choral music, a human art form podcast mini series. See you later.